thought we would do to, to wrap up the day here, you've got a lot of technology, a lot of neuroscience today. We thought we would, would add a little dose of art. And we invited uh, Greg Dunn, uh, a, a trained neuroscientist. Uh, he has a PhD in, in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania. Now a, a full-time artist um, living in Philadelphia. We thought we'd invite him to, to exhibit at the reception. Um, you'll see uh, Greg's work. And um, I would also like to invite Greg to, to say a few things about art and neuroscience and, and to pave the way for, for his exhibition. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Kunal. Uh, it truly is a pleasure to be here, uh, despite the fact that I'm coming at a lot of these issues from a very oblique angle from, uh, from the rest of you guys. But um, I wanted to start with just a basic question, which is, how do you believe that the average person out there really thinks about the brain? How do they think about the part of themselves which is the most fundamental aspect of themselves and simultaneously is the most complex object in the entire universe? Um, I would say that more than likely uh, they would reference an image that looks like this, something that you'd see in Scientific American or in the New York Times. Um, these are sort of memes of neuroscience illustration, and of course you have some, some imaging down at the bottom there. Um, and what these images are doing is that they're trying to reduce the scientific complexity into something which is digestible, at least for the, the general public. Um, I'm sure that everybody in this room would agree that these images don't come even close to illustrating how complex the brain actually is. And they're totally missing the dimension which has been discussed at length today, which is the role of circuits and how the brain evolves in time. I personally believe that it's of fundamental philosophical importance that the average person understand more deeply what's going on in their minds and what an insanely sophisticated and beautiful piece of machinery we have that would enrich everybody's kind of appreciation for their own biology. And so to this end, I spent the last two years uh, on a National Science Foundation grant through the University of Pennsylvania with my friend and applied physicist, Dr. Brian Edwards, um, to create what is the world's most complex illustration of the brain. And I'm just gonna fast forward to the good part here. Um, so what you're looking at right now is an 8 foot by 12 foot reflective micro etching, which is a technique that he and I invented in order to display incredibly complex subject material. This is not a digital image. This is a piece of art hanging on a wall that's being photographed with a camera. What you're seeing is 500,000 neurons in action right now, and this is designed to be showing you what's happening with your brain in this very moment. Uh, and thus is called self-reflected. I'll show you a few close-ups of the piece, uh, which, is being, which is evolving in time here. Here's some of the reticular formation in the brainstem. <clears throat> this is some of the, uh, the intracortical circuitry happening in the parietal cortex. <clears throat> this might be what's happening when you're playing soccer, you know, running around, uh, trying to visualize some of the activity in the cerebellum going into the deep cerebellar nuclei. So what is a micro-etching? Uh, at its fundamental level, all it is is a zillion tiny little etches in a sheet of metal. In, in this case, we use gold. Uh, this image that you see on the right there is a, an extreme close-up of the surface of a micro-etching, which is made, as you can see, of all these tiny little etches which are going in different directions. And you can see that there are components of neurons, or axons in this case, which are crisscrossing one another that are close to one another in XY space, but which are reflectively defined from one another based upon this angle that they're etched at. So what you can't see is that there are colored lights above this image here, and the light which that etching is picking up is the one which is most perpendicular to it. So if you change your relationship angularly to this image, then the colors will all shift. So you can essentially animate images using this technique. This is what the etches look like under scanning electron micrograph. Uh, on the right is a 1200x image. So we have these little cylindrical reflectors in the surface. Um, some of this work came to the attention of the National Science Foundation a few years ago, uh, and they invited us to apply for this grant, uh, which we eventually received, and uh, produced this piece for the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. And the first question was, what the hell are you going to show? I mean, of all of the cool stuff that you could show in the brain, what we decided on is to do an oblique sagittal section. Um, sagittal because it's the only slice which is not symmetrical, so you can have the greatest diversity in structures. We tilted it a little bit to, uh, to avoid the ventricle. And, you know, we're going through midbrain, cerebellum, brainstem. We're getting the internal capsule there. There's a lot of really interesting circuits contained within this slice, so that's what we decided to do. Um, 
So we reduced this image to a cartoon, essentially, where we're mapping out where all the gray matter regions are, like you'd see in the Allen Brain Atlas or something like this. And then we went through with some neuroscience students and we um, did deep research uh, in the primary literature to figure out things like what types of neurons are in each of these regions, what do they look like, what are they connected to, what's the spatial orientation of them, uh, what are their firing patterns like, uh, just reams of data that we we're collecting to inform the production of the piece. Um, what this image is showing you is uh, these compilations of gray matter that we were making. So based upon all this data that we had collected, we painted each of, each of the 150 different families of neurons that we found in all these different regions via a technique where ink is blown around on sheets of non-absorbent paper. And the turbulence of the air causes the droplets to split into these dendritic forms. And conceptually, it's very similar to how a, a a dendrite might be coursing through a particularly dense uh, extracellular matrix. So we painted all these neurons by hand and then scanned them into the computer and vectorized them, turning them into mathematical shapes. So essentially at this point we're working purely with math. Um, at this point we took these neural libraries and we were able to paint down wide swaths of gray matter like this. This is just a small region of cortex, with probably a few thousand neurons, um, and produce the gray matter using this method. The white matter was also drawn by hand, though it was inspired through some diffusion spectrum imaging data that we had from some collaborators from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in order to adapt it for our algorithmic use later, later we ended up having to do all this vector work uh, by hand, but we, uh, we referenced some of that data and produced the white matter data set. So at this point, we have gray matter, white matter. We have an extremely complex and very large two-dimensional illustration of the brain, which is probably already uh, the most complex illustration of it. Um, but it's what came next which really defines this project, which is how do we impart causality and circuit dynamics into this data. Um, the general idea was that we would take gray matter data uh, that I had showed you before, which we might have a beginning point and an end point as nodes in this circuit, and we would have a white matter track that would be connecting those two regions. What we're feeding into this custom algorithm is we want you to start with this gray matter set. We want you to connect into this white matter set that we're providing to you. And we want you to synapse onto the receiving set of dendrites uh, that are your target. And um, what the algorithm is doing is it's essentially drawing those axons for you based upon the suggestions of this white matter that we have drawn. And what it's able to do is to sequence all this information in time. So if you're telling it, we want time zero to be when the first set of neurons starts to fire, it's going to be able to sequence the amount of time it takes for that action potential to travel along the fiber, whether it's myelinated or not, and synapse onto its target. So it's taking into account distances and this sort of thing. It's taking into account if there are multiple neurons synapsing onto the same set of dendrites of a, of a receiving neuron. and it's it's essentially balancing this equation across many thousands of neurons at a time. So it's actually emulating the way in which the brain is connected. Uh, this technique is only to, able to display one action potential per neuron per cycle of animation. So we're obviously limited in some degrees. But this is what the, uh, the input into the algorithm looks like. Each line horizontally is one step in choreography, we were calling it, which has about 30 different variables which are how fast is the action potential going? Is that set of neurons bursting? How much chaos is there in the connections between um, those neurons uh, in order to more closely emulate what it's, what it's doing? So this is the data output from those steps that the algorithm is producing. Um, in this case, color is encoding time, uh, which will eventually code ang angle of hatch in the final micro-etching. So how you read this data is any red pixels would be viewable all the way from the left. And then as you walk across the piece, you would be seeing orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple finally on the other side. <clears throat> so if we zoom in a little bit closer, this is the, the motor cortex. Let's go in even closer still. Um, this is what the output data looks like. And the way that this is generated is through a separate set of algorithms, which is asking the question for every pixel, where is the light source? Where am I in XY space? where based upon the color that I am, am I going to be sending photons? And based upon those coordinates, we can calculate the math and the angle that we need at every given point. 
Then we line everything up using vector calculus in order to give images like this. So the, the final piece is about 30 gigabytes of binary data that's printed at ultra high resolution onto transparencies that we then use to photolithograph the surface. So this is a, a process where light is used um, to carve three dimensions into a polymer photoresist surface. And then we gold leaf on top of that. Um, so you can see the squares of gold being applied to this micro etching. And in the final piece, there's about 2,000 sheets of gold. Uh, we made 25 individual, individually micro etch plates, which are aligned up against one another, uh, and then assembled into the final piece, which is an 8 foot by 12 foot mural at the Franklin Institute. So this is what it looks like under white light. But remember that there is no, the image essentially is fixed, but how it appears is completely flexible. So you can just put different lights on top of it and get any number of different images out of it. Color has been turned into an infinite variable with this technique. Um, so this is uh, the cerebellum under some multicolored lights. Here's the frontal eye fields, a, a gyrus, uh, the parietal cortex. We have another close-up of the, uh, the gray matter in a uh, parietal gyrus. And you can also read this image now based upon what color each, the, each of the different layers are. You can tell that there's a functional and time difference in the circuits as this uh, region of cortex is processing. For example, the red neurons would be layer five, uh, which are functionally distinct. Um, and are firing, in, in this case, as a unit. Uh, uh, here's the motor and somatosensory cortices and uh, the brainstem and cerebellum. So this is what the piece looks like in situ. And uh, the big question that I asked myself over and over and over again after this two-year period was, why? Why would we make this thing? Um, and the reason is that just imagine a little kid walking into this space. The piece is about as big as the screen. Just standing right here with this gigantic glittering gold surface in front of them with the light strafing over it for the first time, half a million neurons making their circuit connections, and that kid just standing there for just a moment and saying, wow. And that applies to every one of you in this room. I mean, I know for myself as a neuroscientist, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the minutia and so difficult to have a slice of that big picture again. But what this piece is designed to do is to connect to people's emotions, to communicate through perception, and to hopefully inspire a new generation of neuroscientists, and to communicate what complexity actually means. Does this piece replicate consciousness in any way, there is, it is not even close to doing that. It is hundreds of millions of times less complex than the brain actually is. But because it's not something that you're learning about abstractly, you're actually perceiving it, it has a much better opportunity to be making an emotional impact on you, uh, which I believe is a unique power of art and something that I am very motivated to continue doing with my career. So the first of these hangs at the Franklin. Our ambition is to get more of them hanging at museums around the world and foundations and things of this sort. Um, these are some of the organizations which either have some of my work hanging or have written about um, this project and some of the other ones that I've been working on as well, if you're interested to learn more. Uh, I also have a website, of course, uh, which I'll tell you about. And uh, I would like to send my sincere thanks to Inscopix for having the opportunity to speak here. It's really a privilege and an honor, and a special thanks to, to Pushkar and to Beatrice for, uh, for helping me to set everything up. Thank you.